Good morning. We are live on Facebook and uh, I'm here with uh, Karen Ann from International Montessori School. Welcome Karen. Thank you, so nice to be here. So my name is Ruth, uh, Ruth Benny from Top Schools. Uh, welcome to our page, please, please like and subscribe. And we're here today uh, with Karen Ann of Montessori School to talk about growing up bilingual. Um, Karen. Yes. Did you grow up bilingual? Yes, I did grow up bilingual. So um, I'm, I'm a Hong Kong girl through and through. I was born in, and raised here um, to, in a Eurasian family. So my father is Chinese and my mother is English. And, um, but I, I grew up speaking Cantonese at home, English as well, obviously. And I went through that and I went through local school. Um, so for me, Hong Kong is my home and, and bilingualism was just a part of everyday life. Right. Yeah. Growing up bilingual is is probably the most asked topic of all time. Yeah. Whenever we meet parents, is it the same for you? Yes, many. It's what we all would love to provide for our child. Right, right? It, me included. I yeah. mean, you know my personal story. So, as parents, I think I mean, almost eighty plus percent of parents that we meet would love for their children to be bilingual. Um, now, you set up a, a dual language program in the International Montessori School. Yes. And um, so, can you tell us a bit about? that, how it works, and, and the, the logic behind. Yes, so at IMS, um, you know, I think reflecting on what I had when I grew up, um, I did have a lot of Eurasian friends, mm. but many of them chose English as the main language back in those days, right? They still do. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and for me, there was such a strong insistence in my family from my parents that we spoke both languages all the time. Mm. It was so much a part of the environment. Mm. And I think at the end of the day, that is the key, right? And it's the greatest gift that I was given as a child. So when we started the school, mm -hmm. we were looking at how do we mirror that? Like, how do we mm -hmm. do that? Oh, and it's, so it's in, our, in all our classrooms, we have um, the two teachers, the English and Chinese, all the time. They're yeah. speaking their language, which is what we often tell parents. Yep. Please do speak to your child mm -hmm. in your language or in, in both languages mm -hmm. if you have both at home. Um, so having that natural environment obviously is important, mm. but the other thing that is particular and you know to us and to Montessori in, in especially is that in Montessori, uh, if anybody's been to a Montessori classroom, there's many many learning materials, mm. and because the children don't learn just by a teacher teaching them using words, mm. but they learn through a material hands on. You can use that material in English mm. or Chinese or French or German. It doesn't matter. Mm. So the classroom is very well suited to multilingual experience for the, mm. for the child. Mm. And we found that, that that's very mm. powerful and it really works. Mm. So is there evidence, like traditionally there, there have been Montessori programs in, in the right. US or yes. in other European... I mean, Montessori is from Italy originally, right? Yes. Was the original Montessori program bilingual? No, the original when she started, when mm. Montessori was in Rome and she started a school mm. for children, and the way she did it was she really observed what works with the children, mm. and she came up with this sort of hands-on mm. method. So it started in Italian. However, as her, uh, as her method developed and became more well-known, it was picked up in the US. Mm. Alexander Graham Bell really, really uh, found it helpful and started some schools. And then during the war, she moved to India. Mm -hmm. So she had a lot of experience working in different languages. Mm, right, and she herself was bilingual, presumably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think she was mainly Italian, oh, but I'm not. sure as a European, mm. you know, her exposure mm. to languages mm. was very, very okay. broad. Um, good morning, so welcome. We're here with Karen Ann. We're talking about growing up bilingual. Um, if you have questions, please keep them coming and we will try to get to them as we, as we go along. Um, so, so Karen, I know that the um, recruiting Chinese teachers is a pain point, it's a pain point for us, and you've come up with a, a sort of an approach that's a bit different from some other schools in how you nurture your Chinese teachers to, um, you know, to, to deliver this approach. Could yes. you tell us more yes, about that? Yes, so when we first started the school, obviously uh, Montessori was from the West, right? So they weren't. We, we hired Montessori trained, and it's a very comprehensive training mm -hmm. uh, school uh, teachers to be in our school. But they were mostly from overseas, not mm -hmm. in Greater China. Um, so we really looked for teachers who were looking to teach Chinese or teach everything in a much more um, holistic and yeah. you know active mm -hmm. fashion, engaging the child actively, having that mindset first. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then on top of that, of course, we want to train them in the Montessori uh, way. Um, and um, initially, we, we did a lot of that in-house, but in the last 10 years or so, mm -hmm. we do have, they have started training programs in Chinese. Yes. So we do uh, bring that, we do send a lot of our Chinese teachers mm -hmm. to receive their training, sometimes in China, but sometimes overseas, mm -hmm. depending on their language mm -hmm. um, background. But I think the most important thing for the learning of Chinese for um, well, we're in our school. We're a very international community. Mm -hmm. We do have some. We have families who have some Chinese at home. Mm -hmm. They might be Chinese families. They might be Eurasian families. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot of overseas mm -hmm. Western families as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the biggest the biggest two things are you know getting the children in the environment early so they get yes. exposed mm -hmm. to the language, they use it, they hear it, mm -hmm. and they pick it up very quickly. Mm -hmm. But also having faculty that yeah. have real faith in the child's ability yes. to pick up that language. And yes. you know, every child is different, right? Yes. But you know, whether the child has the language environment at home, of course does does help. But but you, you want to understand that if they've started early, they, they can learn it. And having that that right. confidence and right. that belief I think makes a world of difference to what the children can do and what they think they can do, right? What hundred percent. So, and of course, we'll get to parent support in a moment. I mean, what we do as parents um, can can influence, but the teachers are crucial. And I like that the faculty that have faith, and um, because we've talked before, and in my experience, I've I've come across dozens of even maybe hundreds of Chinese teachers who don't quite have that faith. Yeah. And and when you as a parent do, it's disheartening. It's 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 very sad to encounter teachers that don't. Yeah, um, and it, of course it's a vic victorious cycle, right? You have some faith, you see it happen, and you have more faith, and it's a cycle. Yeah. yeah. So, so what do you look for in a Chinese teacher? I'm, I'm interested in really how you find um, these teachers and how you, you nurture them to in this in this approach. Is there something that you specifically look for when um, taking on Chinese teachers? I, I think it's more of a feel, right? When you speak mm -hmm. with them, and mm -hmm. and you know, you look at their background. Mm -hmm. um, for example, we have one teacher with us who spent uh, half a year teaching in Africa. For Chinese. Chinese, and, you know. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, you're like, okay, well, this person clearly has an open mind, mm -hmm. right? That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a, a more particular example. Mm -hmm. But often it's, it's the feel you get. And then, you know, you, they, when they come in the classroom, the classroom, our classrooms are very different. There's a lot of movement. The children are... Have freedom to do things. You mm. see different children doing different things at the same time. Um, it's not easy to get used to, mm. right? Mm. So you really have to embrace that. Mm. And, and you know, we, we we provide. You know, the teachers can have a look and see if it, it's something that excites them as well. Mm. Mm. Understand. Um, so if you have questions for Karen about anything Montessori, particularly on growing up bilingual, please post your questions and we'll, we'll get to answer them. So we've just talked about teachers and how crucial it is for teachers to have faith in the children because in my experience the teachers underestimate children's abilities. Right? Could you talk to us a little bit about the starting early um, idea that, that is it different learning a language when you're you know below the age of one or below the age of three as opposed to to later on yes yeah, so well obviously exposing the child to the language as early as possible mm -hmm. does have great benefits mm -hmm. and you know when parents come in and ask us what do we do um, for any Chinese family I say just speak Chinese because English is so prevalent and if the parents so, cannot and if the parents cannot then I say, you know, try and look for some opportunities to, you know, bring the language to your children at a young age. There are some play groups, there are some, sometimes people bring in a, a, a student who can play with the child. Obviously, you have to make it engaging and, and right. you know, relaxed. Yes. Right, and you have to, I'm bringing my own, from my own experience, you, you have to just engineer those natural, authentic, moments. I, I know it sounds like a, a contradiction, but do you understand what I mean? You really have to look for and, and organize those opportunities because they won't just happen if you don't do that. Yes, I, I, I think that is true. And, you know, one way is to look for also, um, you know, which in Hong Kong there probably is a stronger need for is 
activities for the children to do in there China. There is a stronger need. Right? Yeah. There's a need to, yeah. to be able to provide that as yeah. well. Um, so that children can, you know, swim in Chinese or do Taekwondo in Chinese right. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, there is a need for that. Would you consider offering that? <laughs> oh, yeah. The summer programs or I, something. I did want to add one other thing to mm. the teachers, if I mm. might. Yeah. We were talking earlier about the mind frame of the teachers, mm. but it's also important, especially in an international setting, that teachers have the opportunity not to just be a Chinese teacher, but they teach everything. Right. Right. So our Chinese teachers, they teach everything. Of mm. course, the focus they have to make sure the language, but they teach mm. the math. They teach geography right. and it's really right. in the classroom you right. see both teachers engaging mm -hmm. with the children in multiple areas right. and the, the the teachers have um have a different level of ownership yes. of the child's full development yeah. as well i've heard yes. that before that that all teachers are language teachers um, yeah you heard that yeah um, we, we have a question from Madhu, thank you for your question. Um, when a child, you, you have two teachers in the classroom most of the time, when yes. a child favours one language over the other, how do your teachers manage that? Yes, so children, most of our children come in pretty early, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just natural, of course. So, so when they're young, there is less of that favouring, yes. right? What you want is both teachers to be very nurturing, welcoming, mm -hmm. and um, and the, the children just work in that environment and mm. navigate. Now, if we find that a child is really only sticking to one language, mm. then um, you know the other teacher will have to make special effort to engage the child more. It doesn't work <laughs> to say, well, you can have you know 20 minutes with her after you've had 30 minutes mm. with me. That's not going to work, mm. right? It has to be organic. Okay. Um, and that's one of the beauties of how right. the environment works. Um, so. I think at the end of the day, each child is going to progress. If you don't have Chinese at home, is going to progress a little bit differently, different pace mm. or different things first. Mm. Almost all the children comprehend very, very yes. quickly. They understand what's mm. going on, mm. and that's the basis, mm. right? The oral language is where yeah. you get all the vocabulary that they can use mm. the language mm. and all that. And mm. then whether they speak or not can sometimes... Um, be a little bit different at different mm -hmm. pace. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I can share my personal story as well, another one of my personal stories, not me, but my mm -hmm. own family, my own children. Mm -hmm. So I have two daughters, and at home I speak, obviously, only Cantonese to them. Um, they get English everywhere else. My husband is, is Swiss, so he speaks only French to them. And he's been very, very good at just speaking. He never sways. Um, and... You know, so the children understood everything. They would, at the beginning, say simple things like, can I have an ice cream in French? Mm. But then suddenly at age seven or so, mm. they sort of built up that mm. vocabulary, mm. that confidence, yeah. with a few trips mm. to French-speaking places, yeah. Yeah. and it just sort of explodes. Yeah. And now they're in sort of early teens, and they speak only French to their dad, mm. and he's the only point of connection in that right. language, and right. grew up in Hong Kong. So it does happen. It does work. But you have to work at it. I mean, I, I have a similar experience. Um, and there's someone asking um, about going to Taiwan for for trips. And that's yes. what I did. Mm -hmm. Do you I've, recommend that? Um, yes, I think if you can take trips to, you know, Taiwan, China, do. Taiwan is a location which is a good start, I think, mm -hmm. um, because it is very, well, firstly, it's very local. You, mm -hmm. you go there, you really speak Mandarin. Mm -hmm. um, Taiwanese, you know, the, uh, the environment is very friendly. Yeah. People are very friendly. So it's easy for all of us to get used yeah. to, easy for the kids. They fit in easily. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some examples of, so there are different, there's like Mandarin school, Mm. Um, there's like YMCA camp that you can yep. join in. I've done almost all of yeah. them. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. there are certain things. Uh, two weeks in the summer, it's it's good. I think mm. everybody has a good time, which is what you want for your kids. Yeah, you you want them to enjoy learning yeah. through the language. Yeah. Um, so you, the, what you describe with yourself and your husband is what's often called uh, one parent, one language, Yeah. right? Um, Sharon, um, hi Sharon, thank you for your question. She's asking, is it bad for one parent to speak both Chinese and English to their babies? I don't know if I can answer if it's mm. bad or not. If you ask me, my strong preference mm. is the one parent, one language. Yeah. Um, I, I am not aware of any 
research that's compared, so I can't have any. Uh, but I think it's just natural, and, and I think for the child, when that happens, then they naturally associate that, and it's much easier to enforce it. Whereas if you do both, yeah, very quickly you can go on the slippery slope to, yeah. Yeah. in Hong Kong, speaking English all the time. Right. Right. Mm. So I would definitely say stick to your language. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing I'd like to add is if, if you're a Chinese family, stick to whichever Chinese dialect works for you. Mm. Like if you're Cantonese speaking, speak Cantonese. Mm. At least my experience is that shift if they're learning Putonghua in school and Cantonese at home, mm. it's not a confusing, not a big difficult, deal. difficult situation. I mean, a lot of parents, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, um, Sharon, if you're saying Chinese, whether that does mean Cantonese or Mandarin, but you're saying it doesn't matter. I think it's more important to speak your mother tongue yeah. than to try and say, well, I want to provide a fully Putonghua right. language. Right. Yeah. Have you come across the experience where you're meeting children who do not have a first language? Have you seen that happen? Do yeah. not have a first language. They speak two languages, but neither of them to native level. We're seeing more and more of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think um, I think you might see that um, in some English Chinese mm -hmm. families, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Where and and you know the question is asked when you're bilingual. Is it mm. is it a zero sum game, right? Right. You know you know can you do it all? Mm -hmm. um, and I do believe that. You know, learning, especially learning Chinese, is is, is hard. Mm. It takes time, mm. right? It mm. takes effort. Mm. So there there is a time factor in there. Um, I do think that in some instances, children who speak one language will have a richer use of vocabulary mm. at a younger age than children who speak more than one. Right. But I think over time, you have a strong basis in both, mm. and then probably you do choose mm. sort of one that you develop more of that. Mm written expertise in, mm. but having that base is so, mm. so powerful and mm. so valuable, I think. Mm. So yes, I, I would say, yeah, probably you do see some that are not quite there, mm. but I think they'll get there. We develop that. Mm. Yeah. yeah, depends on the program. Um, Alicia, thank you for your question. Uh, good morning, everyone. We're almost running out of time. I it's gone so quickly. quickly. Yes. Um, but we're here with Karen Ann of International Montessori School, and we're talking about growing up bilingual. Um, thank you for your question so far. Alicia's asking about parental support. So that was, we were, we were getting to yeah. that. Yeah. And if you have any um, books or favorite resources to recommend. So, so let's talk first of all, we've talked about um, the crucial role that a teacher has to play yeah. in having faith in, in the children's abilities and starting early and uh, the classroom as um, with lots going on in different activities yeah. in different languages. Um, so what do parents, how can parents support that at home? Right. So I think um, we, we talked about if you're a parent who has Chinese, do that. Mm. Um, if you don't have the environment, try to look for ways to provide mm. that environment of just mm. recapping. Yeah. But also, you know, um, looking for, um, you mentioned, are there any books and, and things like mm. that that are, that are nice? Yeah, there are some very nice Chinese books. Mm -hmm. I did come prepared. I brought a few yep. um, um, that I can show for young children. Um, here is, this is my all-time favorite. How do I get it in the camera? This is my all-time favorite um, Chinese book. It's about Chinese New Year. It's a beautiful, beautiful book for young children. I read it at Chinese New Year to my children every mm -hmm. every year, even now when they're bigger. So that's, you know, there are some examples. In Taiwan, they take a lot of books that they sometimes translate from Japanese. The set is very cute for young children, mm -hmm. beautiful pictures as well. Um, one of my, one, one that I like is a local one, which is called Liang Liang, Leung Leung in Cantonese. Um, and this originally was in Chinese with pinyin, and they also have now a version with English. So there are certain certain resources that you can do. But beyond just using resources with your child, it's about creating a Chinese feeling in your home if you have, if you have Chinese. Mm. So if you have Chinese, read the Chinese newspaper, watch the Chinese uh, television. Right mm. now, everybody only watches YouTube. Mm. Everything we watch is in English. Mm. Um, you know, when I was driving my kids in the morning to school, I would listen to the Chinese radio and the Chinese weather. Mm. All those things, mm. just showing that your cho children, that this mm. is important to, this is part of our environment, this is important to us as well, mm. I think is, is powerful. Mm. And if you don't have Chinese in your home? If you don't have Chinese, harder. it's harder. <laughs> and you have to work harder. Mm. And you have to be, you know, 
do you do as they grow up be more dedicated mm. to take those trips mm. and mm. you know we've seen families do that so we have one family who did the Taiwan thing mm -hmm. every year and mm. you know at age 12 the children are completely fluent yeah. everybody's blown away by it mm. and the children feel so much pride um, for getting there and you know I think if you put in the it will require the work but if you put it in you can see mm. the results mm. Do you see, I mean, I think it's a lot to do with a parent, um, parent attitude that failure is not an option. And if parents are on board, or the teachers are on board, then, then, and you're in the right program, it, it can work. But so many parents give up. Do yes, you, yes. Too, I, too early. I mean, maybe it's what you were saying earlier, that they, they maybe they don't see all the receptive language learning is happening, and maybe they've reached the age of five or six and they're still not speaking. The parents get frustrated and they all too often, they give up. They give up early. Yes, and I think that also comes back to um, what is the school providing yes. as well. You know, that, you know, failure. Well, you know, if the school says you, you can't, there's an expectation, it's part of the school, the children yeah. know that. Mm -hmm. um, finding ways to help the children be successful, of mm -hmm. course, is very important mm -hmm. as opposed to mm -hmm. you're failing, you know, you're mm -hmm. not doing well. Is you know, what are you doing well in and where, right. what, how do we make it interesting? Right. And, you know, we've done a lot of work around that, but, you know, that's a nut that everybody's trying to crack continually, right? right? right. Yes. yes. <laughs> Someone was asking earlier, thank you, uh, Lydia, thank you for your question about your, your family speaking bilingual. Um, if, they're, if her husband and she uses Chinese and English every day, is it better to keep the bilingual conversation flowing naturally or force one parent to stick to one language? I think we more or less covered that. Yeah. Um, you favor one parent, one language. Yes, um, I do. But, I do. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, and another parent later, um, earlier on, was asking about: Is there any um, are there any resources for parents or any academic studies that have been done on, on bilingual Montessori programs? Ah, I don't think there are any mm. academic studies on bilingual Montessori okay. programs, but it sounds like an area yeah, we you should need to look do one. Into <laughs> but obviously, there are studies around bilingualism, right? And, right. You know, we all want our children to speak multiple languages, right. but there's all the other benefits behind how the brain works and making connections mm -hmm. and flexibility mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. switching and being adaptable. All that stuff is well yeah. documented as well. So we were just um, there's there's a couple of books that we have in the office here. Um, we'll we'll post the the image uh, in the comments later on, um, and this one is is also they're quite meaty, um, not an easy read, and, and I'm sure that, that there's others that we can post in the comments later on. Um, how do you feel about technology? So thank you, Madhu, for for your um, comment. So we're talking about resources and how parents can support their children, and we talked about books. How about apps and technology in, in supporting children to be bilingual? Um, I think that uh, there are definitely some apps that make learning of Chinese more engaging, right? We know we do know that technology children are naturally drawn to it. Um, so there are some that help you remember doing the strokes and the writing and using pictures. Mm -hmm. We do this hands-on in the classroom, but you don't necessarily have that all that always outside. Right. So that's but that has to be balanced by how much do you want your child on that, that technology mm, platform, mm, right? So I have to confess that in our community and even in my home, mm, um, we don't use a lot of it. But there, you know, there are obviously good resources out mm, there mm, that, that you can mm. access. So Montessori classrooms don't bring in technology, is that right? In the early childhood years, we do have computer in the room, but it's mainly for at certain times there might be something that we want to add in, but the children never go and use it. As they grow older, of course we have primary school as well, where we continue to have this very immersive right. dual language right. environment. Of course the children are using the right. computers much more. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're almost really out of time. Um, we wanted to cover a little bit on literacy yeah. and about secondary school. Yes. Um, so can you just give us a really um, very brief summary of how is literacy tackled in, in the primary classroom? Right. So in the kindergarten, all the children are learning in this very uh, multi-sensory way in the classrooms, all the time two languages. Mm -hmm. In the primary, we still have the two te we always also have two teachers teaching everything in the mm -hmm. classroom, but in addition, we do do an extra Chinese language lesson every day. Okay. 
and in that we do stream, so it's a different approach. Many of our kids who have grown up with us mm -hmm. are in a very near native or native approach, mm -hmm. but we also have children at seven coming in from yeah. Holland, yeah. and we need to give them a much different approach. Mm -hmm. But the whole idea of what we do is we want every child to learn Chinese to their best ability. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we do those in very, very small groups of you know 10 children. They're all in the same ability. There are many levels. So being able to continually challenge mm -hmm. and not go to the lowest lowest common mm -hmm. denominator. Mm -hmm. And then the literacy, you know, we, Montessori doesn't believe in homework, but when you learn Chinese, you have to do homework mm -hmm. because you have to write the characters. So the that's day. really the homework, the daily homework mm -hmm. that the children do. They know they have to do it, they turn it in. Mm -hmm. It's that discipline is part of it as well. Yeah, just um, Kai Chin has asked a question and it, it, it fits now because I, I do think you have uh, a number of children who do the CASA program and don't necessarily proceed to primary. Right. Or maybe they move out of Hong Kong. Do they right. lose that language that they've learned or, or not? I think if you've done the preschool, mm -hmm. you have a basis. But I yeah. do think that if you don't stay in that, because it's that's just building that for day foundation. Mm -hmm. Like I said before, mm -hmm. they're starting to build a vocabulary. They're not really losing it mm -hmm. yet. So if you haven't really, or some of them, right, mm -hmm. different degrees, mm -hmm. you need to keep that going to reap the benefits of that time. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that going from a very strong medial language or bilingual, uh, bilingual uh, uh, environment mm -hmm. into primary school going into a much more strongly one language mm. you you do you do lose yeah unfortunately think, yeah yes. inevitable yes secondary school so international montessori you start with um two years old and you go up to 12 years old yeah right what happens yeah. then yeah so for ims our children we have very diverse families so um our children go into all the international schools mm -hmm. in hong kong mm -hmm. um different people want different things mm -hmm. um but we also i mean consistently have children, for example, going into Chinese International because yeah. we sort of share this dual language, mm -hmm. but we have children going into ESF mm -hmm. and, and, and German mm -hmm. Swiss and US uh, UK based schools mm -hmm. like Malvern, etc. So same question, if they've done the uh, CASA and the whole of primary school and they switch to an English based secondary school, do they lose the language? Um, what we see is our children often graduate into uh, the sort of the top level, top mm -hmm. class of Chinese mm -hmm. in the international mm -hmm. schools. Mm -hmm. And I think that they do well and they keep on with that. So no, they don't lose the language. Yeah. Um, keeping the relevance of it up, I think is important. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And making the children understand, mm -hmm. you've done all the work, keep, keep, keep at this because it's so mm -hmm. valuable for you. Mm -hmm. Providing that context for them. Because mm -hmm. at that point, mm -hmm. it's gonna be down to them. Right. right? If they have lost a lot of the language, are there benefits, um, the cognitive uh, benefits, is Alicia is asking about that. I think, well, she's the same lady that was asking if they only do the preschool and they right. don't continue, are there cognitive benefits to be had? Oh, well, certainly, if you've been exposed to multiple languages growing mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. your brain's been already wired that yeah. way, right? Yeah. So you, you have to be more flexible. Yeah. You have to think before you do certain things. You're probably less impulsive. It, it keys into sort of executive functioning mm -hmm. types of skills that we talk about a lot these days that we think the next generation needs. Mm -hmm. And so certainly there are those benefits. But, um, you know, it seems to be a lost opportunity not to try your best I to continue. Agree. Yeah. So. We are out of time. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. Um, so some let's let's um, some can, parting. Yes. So can, before we part, can I just mention that yeah. um, you know we do have actually an open day coming up. Yes, please do. Yes. We'll, we'll put so, it in the comments as well. Yeah. So on Saturday the twenty sixth, we have an open day in our biggest campus. We have four in Hong Kong Island, but this is the big one in Stanley. So mm -hmm. if anybody's interested in seeing how we all do this, mm. um, please mm. do go on our website. Um, we also have some parenting workshops because Montessori parenting is very specific uh, and very interesting. So we have some workshops in November that you can also find out about. Are they only for your parents or for everyone? No, no, for anyone anybody with very young children, okay. below two years old. Okay. That's sort of at the beginning, what can I do at home? Mm, mm. So those okay. are in November. 
great yeah. we'll put the comments in um thank you karen we have so much more to talk about we'll do yes. this again we do this um from time to time um thank you thank for you. watching um we've been top schools with uh, karen from international montessori school we've been talking about growing up bilingual thank you for watching and for all of those who are not watching live and if you want to post comments uh, we will try to answer those in the comments as well thank you very thank much you. thank you cheers Thanks. okay bye bye, -bye.